The following contains spoilers for the primary, secondary, tertiary, quandary, quintessential, and hexagonal phases of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy radio series, as well as the novels The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, Life the Universe, and Everything So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, Mostly Harmless, and, and another thing. That's right. I kept it to one franchise this time. Kind of. On May 11th, 2001, the world lost a legend. Douglas Noel Adams, writer, humorist, and self-described radical atheist, suffered a heart attack due to undiagnosed coronary artery disease. His funeral service was serenaded by Pink Floyd's David Gilmour, and an asteroid was shortly after named in tribute to him. He was survived by his wife, Jane Belson, and their single child. Although Douglas Adams died almost 22 years ago, his stories and humor live on well into the 21st century, from nerd culture to casual comedy readers to the kinds of people who can only laugh when there's theological philosophy involved, Douglas Adams and his Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series have never been forgotten, and neither have they been allowed to rest in peace. When Douglas Adams died, him being a real person and all, there wasn't much chance for a surprise resurrection. The same can't be said of his characters, the leads of the fifth Hitchhiker's Guide book, who he mercilessly killed off in the hopes of finally escaping the series and moving on to other interests. The Hitchhiker's Guide novels had totally encompassed Adams' life, overshadowing his other works such as the Dirk Gently series and his tenure on Doctor Who. Before the Hitchhiker's novels, Adams had created and penned the original incarnation of the franchise, the first and second seasons of the Hitchhiker's Guide radio series, dubbed the primary and secondary phases. Unlike the novels, which ended in death and depression after their fifth installment, the Hitchhiker's radio show ended on an emotionally neutral cliffhanger, with a scenario not even relevant to the usually similar plot of the novels. Maybe if the radio show had been allowed to continue, if Adams was writing for the BBC and not for a publishing house, the novels wouldn't have ended so bleakly. But, conversely, this wouldn't have allowed for the ultimate satisfying wrap-up that acted as the BBC's eulogy to one of their greatest minds. By the time the fifth Hitchhiker's novel, Mostly Harmless, came out in 1992, Douglas Adams had become famously tired of the series. He had been actively writing or between productions of Hitchhiker's media since 1978. To put it into perspective, he started writing the first season of the radio series the year that Star Wars premiered, and finished Mostly Harmless around the time of Home Alone 2. Adams wanted out. He wanted to move on and focus on other projects without his thousands of raving fans demanding the next installment of his most famous work, so he lashed out in the only way he could. He constructed a brutal and inescapable scenario in which his characters were ultimately killed off, not in so simple a manner as experiencing death, but very explicitly being wiped from existence in every parallel universe. Adams would come to regret this decision later on, and as he worked through the first draft of the third Dirk Gently book, The Salmon of Doubt, he considered reworking the plot to focus on the resurrected Hitchhiker's characters. Side note. Yes, we did just establish that Douglas Adams specifically killed off his characters in such a way that they could never be brought back, but if you've read or watched any Hitchhiker's Guide media, I think you know how little stuff like that really matters. Unfortunately, Adams would die before he was able to retool the Salmon of Doubt, and what little existed was published in its embryonic form, following Dirk Gently instead of Arthur Dent. Since the early 90s, Adams had been in discussions with author Dirk Maggs to create a third season of the radio series based on the third, fourth, and fifth novels, with the source material, ironically, becoming the adaptation. However, plans to adapt Life, the Universe, and Everything into a third radio season continually fell through until after Adams' death. In September of 2001, Dirk Maggs officially restarted the project, and the series was announced in November 2003. The tertiary, quandary, and quintessential phases were broadcast between fall 2004 and summer 2005, with the final episode airing on June 21st of 2005 and rounding out their adaptation of Mostly Harmless. And yes, the fourth and fifth seasons are erroneously called the quandary and quintessential phases. Dirk Maggs decided that these incorrect words were easier to spell and say than the standard ordinal descriptors quaternary and quinary. What Dirk Maggs created was more than just an audiobook minus the narration. He added and subtracted material from the third, fourth, and fifth Hitchhiker's books that created a more coherent narrative between them, in alignment with his old conversations with Adams. Not only did Maggs bring back Zaphod and Marvin, who were ultimately sidelined in the books, but he revised the storylines and tied together all the plot threads Adams had left dangling in his later stories. When So Long and Thanks for All the Fish was adapted into the quandary phase, more emphasis was put on the 
adventure and less on the romance. When Mostly Harmless became the quintessential phase, the villain's motivations were altered to more closely align with the events of the prior four seasons, going so far as to weave the tertiary phase's retcon of the secondary phase into the lore. By far the most important edit in the second half of the Hitchhiker's radio series was the ending. After Adams repented of brutally executing his heroes, Mags took this reversal and ran with it, crafting a way for them to escape the destruction of the planet in a way that not only made sense within the narrative, but set up several good closing jokes for the series. The climax of both Mostly Harmless and the Quintessential Phase sees Ford, Arthur, Trillian, and Random lured to Earth moments before its destruction in every parallel universe by the Vogons, whose motivation is as simple yet horrifying as needing to fulfill their duties as bureaucrats and check a box on their to-do list. Marvin is already dead at this point, and Zaphod disappeared after the third book, so our heroes have little chance of rescue. Ultimately, the planet is destroyed and the Vogons leave, their leader completely unfazed by his ultimate triumph after more than ten years of struggle. Earth has been wiped out in every dimension, and no indication is given that our beloved heroes may have survived. However, in the radio show, the narrator pipes up to explain that the babelfish that occupy a space in the protagonist's brains are capable of emergency teleportation in the moment before death, a trick they learned from the dolphins, who of course left Earth with the parting message, so long and thanks for all the fish. We're shown three alternate versions of Arthur. One, back where it all began, laying in front of a bulldozer in his little English village, except this time, laying beside him is Fenchurch, his love interest who he lost a long time ago and has been desperately searching for. The second Arthur, to the delight of the fans, is the Arthur we abandoned at the end of the secondary phase, an Arthur whose life took a completely different trajectory from the Arthur of the tertiary, quandary, and quintessential phases. If the additions to the quintessential phase involving Zaphod and the virtual universe weren't enough to convince the listeners that the secondary phase remains canon, this is the ultimate proof. But the third version of Arthur is granted the best ending of all. Along with Ford, Trillian, and Random, he is teleported to Milliways, the restaurant at the end of the universe, where they reunite with Zaphod and Fenchurch, as well as a reconstructed Marvin. A surprise cameo is made by both the Great Prophet Zarquan and Wowbagger the Infinitely Prolonged. When Wowbagger insults Zarquan, the Great Prophet uses his godly powers to rescind Wowbagger's immortality, killing him instantly and ending his miserable existence. And in a final moment that that may not exactly fit, but definitely tugs out the heartstrings, the patrons of Milliways sing Auld Lang Syne as we fade into the credits, the story finally completed after almost 30 years. Except it wasn't. I think you probably know where this is headed based on the thumbnail and title. In 2008, three years after the quintessential phase's happy ending and 16 years after the debut of Mostly Harmless, the Adams estate announced that they had commissioned Owen Colfer, author of the massively popular Artemis Fowl books, to write a sixth Hitchhiker's Guide novel, a direct sequel to Adams' bleak final installment. Colfer didn't accept immediately, later admitting that his, quote, first reaction was semi-outrage that anyone should be allowed to tamper with this incredible series. Ultimately, he did accept the job, and And Another Thing was released in 2009. Jane Belson gave her full consent for Colfer to continue the story, and why not? After all, her husband had often expressed regret over the ending of Mostly Harmless, admitting that he was taking out his depression and frustration on the characters. Adam said that he would, quote, love to finish Hitchhiker on a slightly more upbeat note, and even that five seems to be a wrong kind of number. Six is a better kind of number. He clearly wanted to resurrect the characters, so what objection could there be to someone else making it happen? Well, on the most basic level, Owen Colfer is not Douglas Adams. Without giving any sort of critique on his writing abilities, he literally is not Douglas Adams. And really, only Douglas Adams could ever write Hitchhiker's Guide. Dirk Maggs did an amazing job adapting the last three books to radio, even adding new dialogue to bridge the gaps. But he didn't write a brand new 300-page novel out of whole cloth. Even the 2005 feature film, which is known for its deviations from the source material, was based on a script written by Adams himself several years earlier. Unlike, say, Doctor Who, Hitchhiker's Guide has always stemmed from the cynical and hilarious mind of one specific man. And despite the constant need for the media industry to reboot and reinvent and market franchises for newer audiences, no one can write a brand new Hitchhiker's Guide story that will quite feel genuine. 
A glossed over through line in And Another Thing that I have never been able to fully understand is its commitment to the radio series. Although the novel serves as a direct sequel to Mostly Harmless, certain elements of the radio show, most obviously a massive plot point in the secondary phase that never made it to the books, are casually referenced in Colfer's narrative. This is confusing, but not deal-breaking, for the fans who enjoyed both the books and the show. However, the most poignant example of this is the way Colfer appears to not only continue the story of the books, but to retcon the ending of the show. And another thing begins with the main cast waking up on Earth moments before its destruction, having spent decades within a digital world, living out their lives while only an instant passed in the real world. Side note, this plot point almost, but not entirely, fits with my theory of the last chance of the psyche, which is a whole different video I did on this channel. Go check it out if you're interested in discussions on movie tropes. The cast are then rescued from the planet by Zaphod, who Colfer apparently appreciated more than Adams did. This is all pretty much what you would expect, a last minute rescue was the only way out of that situation if we're ignoring the Babelfish twist. Except, Colfer didn't ignore the Babelfish twist. His version of Trillian explicitly says that her simulation involved them all being teleported to Milliways by their Babelfish. This serves no purpose in the narrative, other than to erase the truly satisfying ending of a 30-year story. I don't assume there's any kind of ill will on Colfer's part, he wasn't exactly pulling a Kubrick with his smashed Volkswagen, so I have to guess he meant this as a fun little reference, an easter egg for the few readers who had kept up with the radio show. But whether or not his intentions were innocent, it just feels wrong. Not only to expand on the tragic ending and put yourself into the shoes of the creator, but to simultaneously tell your readers that the happy ending was never valid. Even Wowbagger the Infinitely Prolonged, who was only ever a bit character, is brought back in an overexpanded role despite being killed by the great prophet Zarquan in the poetically just cherry on top of the Milliways ending. The same goes for the supremely annoying Amiglian Major Cows, as well as Thor, the God of Thunder, who appeared as a minor character character in Life, the Universe, and Everything before starring as a protagonist in the second Dirk Gently book, The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul. Colfer repurposed Thor into a major character for no apparent reason other than hoping to engage readers with blatant references to the previous books. It's understandable for a new writer to try expanding the source material, trying to create some sort of through line rather than just making a bunch of stuff up, but using Wowbagger and Thor in this way, and having Trillian fall in love with Wowbagger as if Colfer has never seen his official design design, shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what made these characters work in the first place. Not to mention Zaphod, one of the central characters, who is reduced to one head and is said to have blonde hair, if I recall correctly, the first mention of his hair color in the series, both of which make me wonder if Colfer wasn't trying to sidle into writing for Sam Rockwell's Zaphod from the 2005 movie. All characters aside, Colfer elected to insert excerpts from The Hitchhiker's Guide into the story, separated by a perforation and the heading Guide Note. As as opposed to Adams, who expertly weaved the quotations into the narrative, to the point where the third-person narrator almost became a character of his own, detailing the story of the protagonist, but taking the occasional digression to quote from the guide. And, to top it all off, and another thing doesn't present its own sort of happy ending. Despite being billed as the final Hitchhiker's book, the novel ends with Arthur once again finding and losing Fenchurch, and once again being besieged by Vogons, the apparent message being that the trials and tribulations of our long-suffering protagonist will never end. I'm not sure what kind of feelings this was supposed to elicit, but if anything, the ending of And Another Thing seems to validate the ending of Mostly Harmless. If Arthur is doomed to forever suffer at the hands of an uncaring universe, is the ending where he finally moves on not the happy one? Adams even wrote, very specifically, that just before his death, Arthur felt an overwhelming sense of peace. This becomes even bleaker the more you think about it, especially since this is a massively tongue-in-cheek comedy we're talking about, but Adams seemed to be implying that without Fenchurch, without Earth, without any real friends, Arthur would have preferred to be killed than to keep moving forward. So Owen Colfer rescuing him at the last minute isn't a rescue at all, especially when And Another Thing sees Arthur finally achieve a pleasant, simple life among humans and alongside his daughter, before ripping it all away on the final page. 
I said in a previous video that the treatment of Luke in The Last Jedi felt purposely disrespectful to the legacy of the character. I don't believe this is the case with Owen Colfer, as an Irish fantasy author born in the 60s. I believe him when he says he loves Hitchhiker's Guide and all its characters. But again, the issue is, no one can really capture the essence of the series other than Adams himself. Anything else is doomed to come off as a copy. And another thing received mixed reviews. It currently sits at a 63% on Google Books, with 4 out of 5 stars on Amazon. Since Hitchhiker's Guide isn't one of the more popular franchises with 2020's audiences, you never see debates about canon and continuity vis-a-vis -vis the radio show versus the novels and where and another thing fits in. But if the chronically online nerds of today did give a thought to Hitchhiker's Guide, whether or not and another thing connects to the radio show and retcons its happy ending could have been the subject of huge debate. At least, until the radio show came back. On the 8th of March, 2018, 40 years to the day since the premiere of the primary phase, BBC Radio 4 debuted the Hexagonal Phase, a sixth season of the radio series based on, you did guess it, and another thing by Owen Colfer. For years, I ignored the hexagonal phase. Having listened to the first five seasons as a preteen, I was ultimately satisfied with the ending, and I'm pretty sure I teared up a bit when Old Lang Syne kicked in, but that may have just been a Pavlovian reaction trained into me by It's a Wonderful Life. It was easy to ignore the Millie Ways reference in And Another Thing and keep telling myself the books and radio show were separate, but I knew that if I listened to the new season, I would suddenly have to acknowledge that the perfect ending had been overwritten. When I started writing this video, I knew I would have to give the new season a chance in the interest of being fair. And I was pleasantly surprised. The hexagonal phase was helmed by Dirk Maggs, who I now know I never should have doubted. He was able to not only faithfully adapt, but even revise and shine up the Adams books, so of course he would be able to put a more Douglian spin on and another thing. Unfortunately, the hexagonal phase does indeed begin with the revelation that the perfect ending at Millie Ways was no more than a computer simulation created by the Guide Mark II. Side note. The hexagonal phase changed the voice of the Guide Mark II from female to male, which would usually be an irritating continuity error, except that now it was played by the late great Stephen Hawking, so I really can't complain. From there, the six episodes of the hexagonal phase basically follow the plot of And Another Thing, essentially a piddling little side quest after the grand finale, sort of like Spider-Man Far From Home or Pirates of the Caribbean 4. See, I don't even remember the subtitle. But Mag specifically didn't want a season of his show to be completely unrelated to Adams, so he incorporated certain unpublished material found in Adams' journals at his university, St. John's College. This mostly took the form of short bits and one-off characters. The real departure from And Another Thing comes in quite literally the last two minutes of the series. Like in the book, Arthur briefly glimpses Fenchurch while traveling through a plural zone and ends up back on the beach where he lived within his simulation. While in the book, Arthur is left alone and despondent and discovers that the planet is about to be destroyed by Vogons, the hexagonal phase sees Arthur reunited with an alternate version of Marvin and Fenchurch, whom he apparently lives with on this beach. His little shack is indeed about to be destroyed by Vogons, but the loving wife he didn't know he had is dutifully filling out a zoning application to appease them. This ending is simple, but nice, and it hits a similar beat as the ending of Mostly Harmless. Arthur is back where he started, just trying to live a simple existence, but being besieged by uncaring people who want to drive a bulldozer through his happiness. While Mostly Harmless took the cynical route, declaring that Arthur was better off dead than living in this cycle of violence, and and another thing agreed, but decided to not let him off the hook, the hexagonal phase implies that Arthur is capable of achieving happiness, as long as his world is kept simple, and he has random and Fenchurch at his side. From a certain point of view, the hexagonal phase was implied by the ending of the quintessential phase. If the characters aren't dead, then they're alive. And if they're alive, then they'll continue having adventures and experiences, both positive and negative. Which is the problem inherent in happy endings. They can last forever in the minds of your readers, but they won't last forever in the lives of your characters. Andy and Red will have financial troubles running their hotel. Marty and Jennifer will go through the ups and downs of a troubled marriage. Dorothy will almost immediately remember why she hated Kansas so much. But that's the beauty in leaving a happy ending untouched. 
Without a sequel, the characters will be caught in that happy moment forever, frozen in the final culmination of everything they desired for as long as they're remembered by fans. We all know their lives wouldn't realistically be sunshine and rainbows here on out, but the moment you make a sequel showing the immediate, unfavorable aftermath of the perfect ending... I'm not here to debate the viability of sequels in general, but I will say with full confidence that whether or not Owen Colfer's And Another Thing was a good book in and of itself, it should not have happened. Yes, it was commissioned by the Adams Estate, but it was not signed off on by the only man who should have any say in a new Hitchhiker's Guide installment. The ending of Mostly Harmless had already been resolved in the quintessential phase, but much like the TV studios that won't let an animated series exist without a live-action adaptation, the ending of the radio show wasn't enough for the powers that be. There had to be another book. Hey, Douglas Adams said so, right? Even if it meant hiring an author who would go out of his way to nullify the perfect ending, not only by showing the aftermath, but by claiming it never happened in the first place. Will there be future adaptations of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Of course. In fact, a new streaming series was announced to be in development at Hulu in 2019 and confirmed in 2020, though information has been sparse. If this series does happen, we can probably assume it will be yet another adaptation of the primary phase and or first novel. I don't believe that every novel needs a film adaptation, but it would be nice to see life, the universe, and everything, or mostly harmless, on the big screen. In fact, a high-budget and faithful adaptation of the five Adams novels, or even better, the five seasons of the radio show, might be the perfect way to round out the franchise and ward off new adaptations for a couple more decades. The main complaint about the 2005 film was its major departures from the novel, but at least it was written by Douglas Adams. And that's the main difference between the radio relaunch and Owen Colfer's novel. The tertiary, quandary, and quintessential phases were not only condoned by Adams, but were in fact originally conceived by him alongside Dirk Maggs. The narrative may have been shifted and a better sense of continuity established, but the plain fact remains that the radio show was based on stories written by Douglas Adams. And another thing wasn't. By extension, neither was the hexagonal phase, though Dirk Maggs honored the legacy of Douglas Adams by weaving his unused material into a story he had nothing to do with. But it wouldn't be fair of me to imply that Owen Colfer's sixth novel is without its supporters. Curtis Silver, a contributor to Wired magazine, called And Another Thing, quote, a thoroughly entertaining and sharply written account of another improbable tale in the improbable journey of Arthur Dent and those around him. Though it should be noted that, like myself, Silver took issue with the Amiglian and Major cows becoming more than just a bit. The book has 562 five-star ratings on Amazon, as well as 286 four-stars. Just to reiterate my point, I personally didn't hate And Another Thing, and it doesn't really matter if I or anyone else liked or didn't like it, it just had no business existing. Douglas Adams could have written the exact same book, and I would have accepted it as the true sixth novel, regardless of quality. Because that's the main issue, isn't it? The audacity for anyone to think they can continue on a series that has, up until this point, been helmed by one very clever and very unique man. One more side note. I am well aware that there was a novel called Starship Titanic, and that said novel was allegedly part of the Hitchhiker's Guide franchise, being based on a video game that was in turn based on a throwaway paragraph in one of the novels. I am further aware that Adams was planned to write the book, and even accepted in advance, but ultimately pawned it off on Terry Jones of Monty Python fame. I don't consider Starship Titanic quite as egregious in its mere existence as I do and another thing, mainly because Adams himself gave the go-ahead, and more importantly, it is not directly connected to Hitchhiker's Guide. In fact, the protagonists come from Earth, which would not still be there if this was in the Hitchhiker's Guide universe. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy may be defined as a media franchise, but it isn't the sort of series where anyone who purchases the rights has earned the honor of writing new stories. From its inception in 1978's primary phase, to its finale in 2005's quintessential phase, to its zombification in And Another Thing, and its hasty patch job in the hexagonal phase, Hitchhiker's Guide has always belonged to Adams. Later adaptations, such as the radio relaunch, may be well written and stand up to the originals, but the moment writers get it into their head that they could create new stories in the Hitchhiker's universe just as well as Adam's, well, that's when we have a problem. But what do you guys think? 
Should Hitchhiker's Guide be franchised out into a larger universe of overlapping stories written by multiple authors? Should the novel series be continued to find closure on that cliffhanger ending of And Another Thing? And what about this Hulu adaptation? Do we trust a 2020s American media factory to handle the series with respect and love for the source material? Should they bail on the TV show and make five really good film adaptations? And hey, did you guys like And Another Thing? Let me know in the comments. And thanks for watching.